What a finish from Balogun! Oh, Benyera, beautifully done! Bobby Young, surely! Here it is! Mbappe now! Wonderful! Gotta be! Lovely finish! That's the goal! Tara Mbappe! It's Ellie Wahi. Ellie Wahi! Well, it's been coming! Put in by Jonathan Davis! Kylian Mbappe brings the part de Bras to its feet! Bonjour and bienvenue. You're listening to Le Boja, the official Liga Uber Eats podcast in English. This is your one-stop shop for all things French football and lots to get through on today's episode. PSG, Marseille, Lille, all through in Europe. We'll take a deep dive into their matches and look forward to their quarterfinals. Is Barcelona a good draw or will memories of past traumas come back to haunt PSG? In the French Cup, there are two tasty semi-finals ahead. It's money time in Ligue 1. After three draws, PSG get a tennis score against Montpellier. 6-2. Game set and Mbappe at La Masson. We'll look back on the remarkable and new... Say that again. It's money time in Ligue 1. After three draws, PSG get a tennis score against Montpellier. 6-2. Game set and Mbappe at La Masson. We'll look back on the remarkable and unique George Weyer. Of course, we've got the latest instalment of Deja Who with a signed Teddy Tuma shirt up for grabs. And we'll look ahead to the next two rounds of Liga, including Marseille against PSG and a vital Northern Derby. Leave us a review, spread the word about Le Bojo podcast, like, subscribe, follow and recommend. Well, my name's Andreas Evagora. I'm sitting in for the irreplaceable Robbie Thompson. Spring has arrived in France. Trees are bursting into leaf. The best laid football plans have been planted. The question is, which will flower into beautiful blooms and which will end up on the compost heap of French football? We'll promise to answer those questions and avoid any other corny cliches with two expert French football correspondents. First, Andy Scott, who uh, runs the football coverage at AFP, the global news agency here in Paris. And he's uh, proudly decked. It's not an Arsenal shirt. It's a Stade de Reims shirt. How are you, how are you doing, Andy? Hi, Andres. Yeah, I'm very good. Thank you. Uh, and the other end of France, uh, what, it's a great time to be uh, in, in spring in the south of France, isn't it, Luke? And to us all, how's things going down there? Our man on the south coast and uh, correspondent focusing on all teams in the south. It's going well. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it feels as though spring has been here for a couple of months almost at this point. But, you know, that's uh, that's always the case. You know, winter never really Yeah, arrives. you're getting us very jealous there, Luke. And Andy, uh, he's from the fine city of Dundee, where it's probably still a bit chilly this time of year. But anyway, let's move straight on to the look back at rounds 25 and 26 of Ligue 1. So, PSG, I've uh, had a funny few weeks. They got three draws which for them is simply not quite good enough. But they really came back into form on Sunday with this uh, huge win, 6-2 at Montpellier, who, to be fair to Montpellier, they really went for it. You know, they didn't sit back and defend. And I say it's been a strange few weeks for PSG because they have started experimenting, which might be a strange time of the season to experiment. Uh, in the uh, Real Sociedad match, they had Usman Dembele playing through the middle, um, the match in the cup, they didn't really seem to play with a right back as far as I, I was concerned as in that match against Nice. They've uh, dropped Kylian Mbappe, which has obviously made lots of news. Uh, we'll start with you, Andy. What have you made of PSG these last few weeks? Uh, I mean, Luis Enrique's mantra is, this is the key part of the season. This is where it all counts. We've heard it all before. We've done our experiments. And this is the big part of the season. Are PSG ready for it or do you still see them in that experimental phase? Well, the strange thing is that, that Luis Enrique has said that he is preparing for next season, of course, when Kylian Mbappe will no longer be there at the same time as, as, as PSG coming into the most important part of their campaign. Um, their, their performances have not been perfect by any means. You know, you mentioned, Andreas, the, the cup game against Nice where they didn't play with a right back. Of course, Luis Enrique... <laughs> Has has uh, has you know he he experiments within games he experiments from game to game in general of course he he would say that the three draws in a row in the league perhaps didn't really matter because they have this huge advantage at the top of the table um, he was able to experiment without Mbappe and there were no you know no great harm was done they've progressed in the Champions League they're still in the cup they are on course to win all three competitions in which they're still involved 
And I think that's a really interesting thing about this PSG team. They are far from perfect. Far, far, far from perfect. You know, you will know that. I know, Andres, you were at the, the Nice Cup game uh, last week when, you know, they played pretty well, but it was by no means the most accomplished performance of a Paris Saint-Germain team. I think you can say the same about the Montpellier game last night, even though they scored six times. Uh, Mbappe was in superb form, but they still looked a bit susceptible at the back. Despite that, and despite the fact that this PSG team has probably looked like the least well-equipped to win the Champions League of, of, of all the PSG teams over the last decade, the draw has put them in a position whereby you almost think now that they should get to the Champions League final. The, the opportunity is there for them to get there because they're on a different side of the draw to probably the three teams that you might say are the, 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 the most fancied, Manchester City, Real Madrid and Bayern Munich. They can't play any of them until the final. And in a one-off game, anything can happen in theory, right? Rather than over two legs where it might be trickier to beat some of these teams. So PSG actually now have a tremendous opportunity. And what Luis Enrique needs to do is seize this opportunity with both hands. And I think he's probably aware of that. Um, they're going to win the league. They should win the cup because they have a home draw in the semi-final. And then the potential opponents in the final, they should be, they should be able to, to see off either Lyon or Valenciennes. And that leaves the Champions League. So huge game coming up next month against Barcelona. And of course, now we have the international break. Another side of that, it's going to be all about winning the games that they have to, to win because they have some big games coming up domestically, but being ready. Yeah, timing is key. You're right. I was at that cup game, which incidentally was um, a really good advert for the French Cup. I was commentating that for the World Feed and I thought it was a, it was a really good game. Um, I was also actually at the Rans game as a, uh, uh, with the fans. I, I had a ticket with PSG fans and the plural of anecdote is not data, but I thought what was interesting was uh, Kylian Mbappe was left on the bench and no one around me was calling for Kylian Mbappe to come on. You know, I was expecting people to be cheering, you know, wanting him to come on and booing it, but it was almost like PSG had half turned the page to the post Mbappe era. Um, and on that, on that score, you know, the good news is that Nuno Mendes is back. Uh, which is important for them. Some of the other young players, I think, are settling in. Maybe we've got a new role for Usman Dembele. Um, how do you see things, Luke? I mean, is this is this a, a PSG getting into kind of a good phase, a good uh, form for them? Or, I mean, if we take the league out as a done deal, how confident are you that they can do well in the other two? But let, let's first look back at the last few weeks. How, how have you analysed the last few weeks for PSG? I mean, yeah, it's been it's been disruptive, I suppose. You know, this Mbappe announcement coming mid-season. I mean, he wanted to minimise the disruption. He spoke about that in great detail, uh, you know, behind the scenes. But ultimately, you know, he does leave uh, or announces his departure mid-season, which, which has knock-on effects on PSG season. And, you know, reports that Luis Enrique is maybe not happy with the timing of it. You know, that's natural. It's come at February, March. It's the crucial time of the season. It came just before Real Sociedad's, you know, the two-legged fixture against Real Sociedad as well. So the timing felt a little bit difficult, and I think the disruption, the the you know, the the you know what what happens post announcement, I think is is understandable. I would say, and then you know there has been a bit of a recovery in in you know in the last week or so, but I, I think that it's ripe to experiment in the league because there's a 12-point gap to Brest, who have not won their last two games. So if you're going to experiment, you know, why not experiment when you've got such a lead in hand that will not be, you know, broken? And then in the Champions League, you, you're set up, you know, Mbappe was not rested in the Champions League. He was not rested in the Coupe de France. You know, he's still acknowledging Mbappe's worth and his importance to the team. It's just utilising him in, in different, you know, in the Coupe de France, in the Champions League, where, you know, these two competitions, of course, are far from a done deal. So it's about maximising his potential in those two competitions, whilst also kind of admitting that, look, this league and title is basically wrapped up. Let's prepare for the future. You know, we've seen a bit of Dembele. I'm hoping we see a bit of sending Mayulu between now and the end of the season. He looks like a really exciting prospect as well. And then obviously there will be new signings. So you can only ever prepare for next season to an extent. Um, but I think that it's right to do so in the, in the league with it already being wrapped up. Indeed, well, we've talked about the top end of the pitch. Defensively, PSG a little bit worrying. Two dodgy goals conceded against Reims. And um, it may be a, a footnote, but the two goals they conceded at Montpellier were really poor. I mean, the Nordan goal, the Danilo back pass. Um, I mean, Andy, very quickly, do, do, do they need defensive reinforcements? Do they just need to wait for defenders to come back, the likes of Skriniar? Because some of the defending, Andy, has been really quite worrying, hasn't it, of late? 
Well, the defence is, is is something of an issue because, of course, they have had so many fitness problems uh, in in that area. Um, they have obviously been without President Elkin Pembe for what the whole season. You know, Marquinhos has been on the sidelines, and they're not the only ones. Milan Skriniar too. So Luis Enrique has had to has had to bring Lucas Beraldo in and play him much more often than I think he would have anticipated. Now he's he's been waxing lyrical about Lucas Beraldo's performances, about about the extent to which he is he has managed to settle so quickly, and he's been very impressed. Um, but is that a defence that can, you know, that can that can win you the Champions League, as it were? Well, that's that's a big question. My my suspicion would be no. Um, the 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 central defence is an issue. Donnarumma, we saw giving away a penalty again last night, which some people would question. It still seemed to me to be not really his fault because it was Danilo Pereira's back pass which left him in that position, but he still clattered into the Montpellier player. Um, he's got that in his locker because he did give away a penalty, didn't he, against Le Havre earlier in the season when he got sent off for it. Um, so they do have they do have weaknesses in, in the centre of the defence. Um, and the right-back situation is a bit of a problem because Ashraf Hakimi is, of course, a tremendous uh, attacking fullback. you know, essentially a, a playmaker getting forward from right-back, creates chances, can score goals. Defensively, can be a bit susceptible. We saw that, of course, with uh, the first goal against Reims last weekend, didn't we, when, when he sort of turned back towards his, his own goal inside the box and, and got caught out. But then when he's not there, as you were saying, Andres, they, they, they essentially play without a right back. It's, it, and that is, that is quite a lopsided sort of uh, way to play. So there are lots of questions about that defence. I think they need to get Marquinhos back and fit. I think probably ideally in time for the Barcelona doubleheader, he, he would be available again. Perhaps Skriniar will be back by then, possibly, but possibly not. Um, it is a problem. Yeah, it is a problem. And I, I think it comes back to what I was saying before, really, that this PSG team is not well equipped to win the Champions League. It's just that <laughs> it's just that this opportunity has opened up for them. And if they can somehow keep it tight at the back and get the midfield in, in order, well, we saw Mbappe, what he did against Real Sociedad in the second leg. Well, he can do that in big games. You know, he's done it against Barcelona in the Champions League in the recent past, scoring that hat-trick. So if they can get everything else just about right, and he shows up on the day, then it might be enough. Indeed. Well, look, we're going to talk much more about PSG <clears throat> in the rest of the pod, but let's take a look at the other teams who are vying for European football next season. Brest, uh, after all this time, finally losing first defeat since early November, um, round 25, and then a draw against Lille this last weekend. But look, still looking pretty good for them. Monaco, who I thought were quite impressive against PSG, uh, round 25, a 1-0 win against Strasbourg, and then they will feel two points badly dropped against uh, Lorient in a, in a bit of a weird game yesterday. There were two sort of madcap uh, own goals. I encourage uh, French football fans to look at those two. Um, Lille, who actually one of my <laughs> tips for the top three at the start of the season, I'm still pretty confident about that. They got a 2-2 draw against Rennes and a draw at Brest, which these days is a pretty good result. One of the matches I was really looking forward to, and, and Luke, if you could comment on, on this, is um, Nice against Lens, because Nice's form has been absolutely awful. I think it was two goals in four matches before that cup tie. Um, they travelled to Lens, who were just starting to pick up form. And what was interesting to me, um, there's kind of a, a, a bit of a backstory to this, because... Um, there's been some movement of, of sports directors from Lens to, to Nice. And that's, that sort of created a new rivalry in French football. And for those of you who don't know France too well, Lens and Nice could hardly be two more different places. Nice is kind of quite a big city <laughs> on the sea, quite glamorous. It attracts, you know, film stars, Formula One drivers, Luke Entwistle, of course. Luke Entwistle. <laughs> um, and just, yeah, a jolly nice place to go to. I really like Nice. Lens is nice as well. Don't, uh, you know, don't at me, any any Lens fans. But, um, you know, the, the Lens tourist board are probably not the busiest in France. It's, it's a former coal mining community, but a fantastic place to watch football. That's the sort of cultural background. Tell us a little bit about this new rivalry, Luke, between uh, Lens and Nice. And a, we have to say, a shock. Nice win. It's certainly surprising for them to get three goals, isn't it? Yeah, so I mean, it all dates back. It's very recent history. It's it's when Florent Gisolfi, who he's you know one of these masterminds of of Lens's revival up from Ligue 2 and then from Ligue 2 to the Champions League within the space of just a couple of years. So Gisolfi masterminded this, and then in October 2022, 
he basically gets poached by Nice uh, and he, he has about a three month kind of um, period of time that he's kind of off. And then he, he joins Nice in January 2023. So they've poached, his, you know, their sporting director, the guy who alongside Franck has, has come in for all the plaudits for what Lons have done and what Lons have become in a very, very short period of time. So that's created a, a certain level of acrimony between the two sides. And as you say, a, a genuine a genuine rivalry now between Lons and Nice as a result of that movement between the clubs. Uh, at Nice, I mean, Lons, we, we can speak about briefly. I'm sure we've covered them in, in depth, you know, their revival. You know, they were bottom of the table, I believe, when it came to the first international break in September. And it looked like being a, a, a real missed season, a real faux pas after that incredible season where they ran PSG so, so close last campaign. But then you have Nice, uh, on the other hand, who had this great start to the campaign and who have been on the podium for almost a whole season, and then go in this awful run where they don't win any of their net, you know, of their last six games prior to this game against Lens. Um, they then drop out of the Coupe de France, and this looks like they're going to basically throw away all of their great work throughout the season in a space of about four, five, six weeks, essentially. And you know, the the problems at Nice are not novel. Um, you know, they have often felt fallen the right side of fine margins because they don't score many goals at all. Um, and, the, you know, the consequence of that is if you're winning games by narrow margins, I think they've won eight games by just a one goal margin this, this season. The problem with that is if you then are slightly less efficient and they're not an efficient side in front of goal, but if, if you're even slightly less efficient and your defenders have a slight drop off as Tadebo has had, as Dante has, has also had, then you're going to fall the wrong side of those fine margins. And Farioli is coming for criticism, saying, you know, what's the plan B here? Because you need to be scoring goals. You need to, you know, liberate these attacking players like Morphy, like Boga, like Tram, who's, you know, seems very kind of shackled in this very structured system. So he's been criticised for lack of plan B. But ultimately, you know, this was a match that I think it, it felt as though it was a bit of a free hit almost this game against Lance. You know, the ball out is such a difficult place to go. Um, you go into the, any game, I think, at the ball, assuming that Lance will at the very least give you a very tough game and that taking away three points is, is you know, even if you're PSG, it's not it's not a given. Uh, and that would be a great result to take away three points. So it's almost a bit of a free hit. And they did seem liberated. They did have a couple of days in Belgium rather than coming back down to Nice because they were playing PSG just a few days before. So they had a, essentially a mini training camp for two days in Belgium, got away from things. They looked mentally in the right place, that the pressing systems, which kind of, become a little bit erratic, I'd say. I think looked really well structured and two of the goals against Lons came from really good pressing and Ali Cho winning the ball up high and, and feeding Moffi, feeding Sharam. So yeah, it, it feels as though they're maybe back on the right track. I think some of these old, old issues, you know, do they have enough goals in this team? I mean, individually, yes, but in terms of structure and creating clear cut chances regularly, no. Um, but if they can, you know, really refine their, their defensive solidity as they still need to do, I think. I think that they should still be one of the favourites for a European place. But I, I think that the Champions League place is now, having gone from the strong favourite for most of the season, I think they're now in the chasing pack. And I think it'll be difficult for them to, to catch back up. But uh, there is time. Indeed. But they've, been, they've had a very interesting story in Nice this year. And I think you're right to pick up on, on Jean-Claire Todibo. The last time I was on this podcast, I was waxing lyrical about Todibo. I was saying he should be on the plane to the Euros. And I really put the curse on him because... Since then, he he uh, he scored his first own goal of his career. He got in a, a let's say a verbal fight after one game, didn't he? he? And fair play to him. He went to talk to some of the the supporters after the defeat against Montpellier, wasn't it? And it, it turned a bit nasty. But look, he's still a young player and still um, a player of of amazing potential. Maybe the Euros might be a, a little bit too too soon for him, but certainly um, a really good defender. Um, let's move on to less good news at Nantes, uh, who have parted ways with Jocelyn Gorvenek, 3-1 defeat against Strasbourg. Patrick Vieira Strasbourg was the last straw for Vladimir Kita, who is, uh, let's put the unpredictable president of Nantes. It looks like Antoine Comboire is back. I say looks like because it hasn't been officially confirmed. Now, we all know Comboire is a Nantes legend. And he last time he was there as a coach, did a superb job keeping them up. Winning the French Cup didn't work out. We could do a whole podcast on <laughs> Vladimir Kita and Nantes, but that's that's for another time. Uh, a quick word about Lyon, who are in a position that they would have only dreamed of a few months ago, mid-table obscurity for Lyon after another good win at Toulouse, uh, still in the Cup. We'll talk about that. And Clermont getting a win. They're not out of it yet. You know, they are bottom, but they beat Lavre 2-1 
uh, Orange also beating Metz in the other game of uh, of the weekend. Now let's take a look at Marseille. Uh, they're they're going to be playing uh, PSG in the next round of games. But first, a quick look back. Um, that game against Villarreal, I'll, I'll ask you, uh, Andy, because you're a great student of, of Spanish football. I'm fascinated of, of, about the mentality of this. They won the first leg 4-0. They go into the second leg. They yeah. drop Aubameyang, who you called it, Andy. He's in brilliant form at the moment. And I, I find it interesting. They clearly went out to defend. They clearly had in their mindset, well, we can concede a goal or two. Uh, they did in the first half, and it was 3-1, but that didn't really tell the story of the match. It was 3-0 at one stage to Villarreal. Paul Lopez yeah. pulled off a couple of amazing saves before uh, Jonathan Close nicked one at the end. But my word, Andy, that would have been a catastrophic defeat if they hadn't <laughs> gone through after winning 4-0. Well, it's the old adage, isn't it? 4-0 is a, is a difficult scoreline. <laughs> um, and and uh, we, you know, obviously, obviously, we were looking back at the... The the famous you know the remontada which which mean literally means comeback in Spanish and of course has become a word in French since the since the 2017 game at the Camp Nou when Barcelona beat PSG six one and I was I was looking back at that game the other day after the draw for this season's Champions League uh, quarter final and just thinking about that game when you know to remind ourselves of the situation that night Bar- Barca were three one up on the night. In the 88th minute, they needed to score three goals, and they did it. And I suppose from a Marseille point of view, you'd say, well, you know, that did not happen on this occasion. But it was mighty close. And it's funny because I was actually out with um, with former pod regular Ma- Matthew Spiro on, on, on Thursday evening, and, and we, weren't, we weren't actually watching the game. Uh, and, and then and he said to me, have you, have you seen what's happening in the Marseille match? And the way in which he said it was like, well, have they? They've not, <laughs> have they? And he said, well, they're 3-0 down. And then obviously... Close scored that goal at the end, uh, and and a, a, a big wobble, a big, big, big wobble. I mean, the thing is that in the I was at the game at the Velodrome, the the first leg, when of course they, you know, they were excellent. I mean, I'm not sure that four nil was perhaps quite a fair reflection on the way the game went that night, but they they did play very well. It seemed like nothing could go wrong for Jean Louis Gasset for, for Obama Young as well, because in the first leg, of course, he scored that goal, which he insisted. He spoke. I spoke to him after the game, and he said he meant it. That that chip you know, from the left-hand side of the penalty box into the far corner. But for me, I'm convinced it was a cross. But, you know, everything was going right for them in that first leg. Everything had been going right for them under Gasset. And then their luck kind of runs out against um, against Villarreal until until they, they just see it through with that late goal by close. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, Gasset himself said it at the end of that game that, you know, Marseille are in the quarterfinals. That's that's all that matters. I mean, to win the tie five five three on aggregate is is very impressive against a team who are in mid table in La Liga, but who have actually been in good form uh, in in recent times. You know, they won away at Betis, they beat Valencia at the weekend, so they've been doing well. And um, that's 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 great from a Marseille perspective. Through to the last eight, they have probably one of the probably arguably the most winnable tie. I mean, I'm not saying it's an easy tie, but Benfica um, is a team that they they can compete with. You know. Toulouse ran them close uh, um, in the, in the round and in, in the playoff round, and um, and and there are clearly some weaknesses to exploit in that Benfica team. And if they get through that, the chances are, I, I don't think they're going to win the Europa League, but the chances are they might get a semi final against Liverpool, which would be quite a quite an occasion. Um, so if they can do that, and if they can somehow salvage a European place, it may be that seventh position is enough to get into Europe uh, in, in in some form or another then that would have to be considered a successful season given where they were in the league uh, not so long ago, of course, when they got when they, when they parted company with Gennaro Gattuso. Um, they lost yesterday in Rennes. That was a difficult game. And, and obviously off the back of the match in Spain, perhaps inevitable there would be some drop-off. The key now is for them to regroup over the international break to get the house in order because, of course, they have a huge game uh, the, in, in two weeks' time. They, they, um, they, they play PSG, don't they? So... You know, I, I think they've still got a lot of work to do, but I think they have done some remarkable stuff since since Gasset came in. They certainly have. I mean, Gasset, b- b- when he came in, he got that win against uh, Nantes, a 2-0 win, the, the defeat against Rennes, uh, as you mentioned, and, and the success, albeit pretty close one, in Europe. L- Luke, how, how are you rating Gasset? We should say Gasset is only here to the end of the season. Uh, Marseille have made it clear he's he's not going to be, uh, his contract won't be extended. He's 70 or... 71 years old. He certainly, you know, let's say towards the back end of his career. And there, there were some comments about that. I, I saw an interview with um, a Vox Pop with a Marseille fan when he was um, appointed 
And uh, this Marseille fan said, look, the Americans have brought us a Joe Biden, you know, in reference to to, to his age. But Gasset's done really well. He's he's clearly can communicate with the younger players, many of whom he, he'll know already because he's been around the scene. How would you assess Gasset so far, uh, Luke? How's he done? I, I think it's quite an interesting one because, you know, football has become very tactical. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a natural trend that it's, you know, you're moving towards, especially in the Uganda, there's lots of foreign managers coming in with new ideas, uh, as has been the case, been the case, especially this season. We've spoken about Farioli already, but, you know, he's spearheading this kind of new wave of, of managers who have different ideas of how the game should be played. And obviously he's very old school. Uh, I mean, he comes in and he says, you know, 80% of performance is mentality. And look, he has no time to work with with these players. You know, he's playing every three days, Europa League, League 1, Europa League, League 1. So he has no time to work on any tactical ideals or implement a different structure to the one that was already essentially in place under Gattuso. Yet, the you know, the difference between Gasse and Gattuso is very much night and day. So, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, it, it is, you know, 80% of performance is mentality. I'm not necessarily going to go full out and, and agree exactly with what he said there, but Clearly, he's instilled something mentally uh, in this young side that does need, I think, a character like his rather than this kind of animalistic style that Gattuso had that has, you know, had huge, you know, huge upturn in results. You know, those five results, those five wins in a row, obviously, it's come to an end at Villarreal. I thought it's quite funny that he previewed that game saying, you know, all the, you know, it would take a catastrophic performance for us to lose in, uh, in, in Villarreal. And, you know, it, it, I think it was meant as a warning, but ended up being a bit of a blueprint for what was a pretty dreadful game. But, you know, essentially they've gone there with something to defend and, and mentally that, that, that can be kind of quite difficult. And then obviously they lose their, their winless run also in the league and against Ren. But I think he's done a great job in just putting, you know, his arm around some players and about working on the mentality of this side that I think is still, uh, can be a little bit brittle. Uh, but I think that has made progress in these very this very, very short period of time. But I think that this last week is is important, I think, for the club in a, in, in a medium and long-term way because of the fact that I think it, it shows that not everything is well at Marseille. And we said that all season, but you almost forgot it the past two, three weeks because of the performances, because of how many goals they were scoring, how few they were conceding. So I think it's a timely and a much needed reminder of the fact that, you know, they need to be working on next season already about who they're going to appoint to replace Gasset in, in the d- direction that they're heading in and the strategy that they're taking, you know, especially with this very short term as a moving on players every two years. You know, I think it, it, it poses an existential question, I think, that does need to be posed um, so I, I think that Gasset's done very well, but I think that this little blip is a timely one and, and will maybe kind of click things into gear going forward in the next one, two years. Yeah, it's going to be another big summer for Marseille, isn't it? But look, on, on the positive side, uh, Aubameyang, 23 goals in uh, in all competitions, eight assists. He, he really is hitting form. So good call out to Andy Scott, who uh, <laughs> predicted that. Um, and you know, Marseille playing some good football. And, and we're obviously, you know, looking forward to that classic. We'll talk about that later in the pod. You've both alluded to the international break, which is coming up. Uh, Le Bleu, two friendlies, Germany in Lyon on the 23rd of March, and then Chile in Marseille on the 26th. So let's move on to the Coupe de France. We're at the semi-final stage. Uh, we have two matches, Lyon against Valenciennes from the second division and uh, PSG against Ren, we have to say PSG are the favourites and, and, and Leon too. <laughs> Let's start by uh, looking at that Leon match. Andy Scott, I suppose this is a way of salvaging their season. I mean, we've talked about what, what a story Nice have had, what a season Leon have had. But yeah. if they end up with uh, winning a Coupe de France, dare I say, it might be a, a decent season. And they're obviously big favourites against Valenciennes. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing about that, of course, they should beat Valenciennes, and obviously the the cup semi-finals in France are, are they're not played on neutral territory. They're not played over two legs. It's simply a home tie for Lyon, um, and you would imagine that they will come through that. I mean, I I commentated their game in the last round against uh, Strasbourg when they needed penalties. It was a, a pretty poor cup tie, really. Um, so having home advantage that night didn't massively help them until the until perhaps the penalty shootout, but. You know, they are a team who have improved enormously under Pierre Sage, as we've talked about on the podcast before. As long as Alexandre Lacazette is fit, that probably makes all the difference. Valenciennes are a team who not only are in the second division, but have been struggling in Ligue 2. So, you know, Lyon should come through that. And I think that, as you say, it's a chance for them to salvage this season because, you know, they're not, despite their incredible resurgence in the league, they're, they're surely not going to qualify for Europe via the league. That would be a step too far. 
if they can get to the final, then that might just uh, keep keep the dream alive. But you know, I'm just thinking there in my head. I'm just thinking, well, if PSG don't get to the Champions League final, um, then that game could be Kylian Mbappe's last match as a Paris Saint Germain player. Um, PSG will have wrapped up the league and title by that point, and it's you know, I, I mean. This is maybe getting ahead of myself because PSG have to win a semi-final, of course, against Rennes. But again, they've got a home tie. And if PSG get to the final, which will be played in Lille uh, this season because because the Stade de France is um, is out of use as it's been prepared for the Olympic Games. Um, I suspect that, that anybody coming up against PSG that night might find things a little bit difficult. So, um, you know, I think maybe... Maybe winning the cup might be a step too far for Leon, but you know they're a club who, who again, as we've discussed on this podcast many times before, it's been too long since they won a major trophy. You know, it's been twelve years since they won any silverware, since they won the cup in in, in twenty twelve. So they, they they could do with winning a trophy, and it would certainly cap uh, an incredible comeback this season. But regardless of what happens in in the cup, the, the, their turnaround in form has been absolutely remarkable under under Pierre Sage. Certainly has Pierre Sage, yeah. We, we, the translation for that is um, wise stone, isn't it? Which I thought was quite quite a good way of, of describing that coach. Uh, PSG <laughs> Ren, Luke, of course, there's some recent history. The, the the French Cup final a few years ago when Ren stunned PSG on penalties under Julien Stéphan. Am I right in saying if there's one team that can go to PSG and win, it's probably Ren who are unpredictable, but when they're good, they're really good, aren't they? I mean, could there be a surprise there, Luke? I mean, the one side that can beat them and the only side that, that has beaten them at the Parc de France is, is Nice. And they didn't give them too much of a game, which I think is, is a telling sign of, of how strong PSG are at this point of the season. We've already gone into it, but not necessarily in the league, but they're tailoring their whole, it seems their whole schedule around being successful in the cup. Yeah, I mean, Ren, an unpredictable team, but a team that I predicted to, I believe, at the start of the season, finish comfortably in the top three or the top four. Um, they have, you know, a wealth of an arsenal of incredible attacking talent that is not always clicking, but it is once again. Uh, Terrier is looking something like the player he he was before that ACL injury. Kellen Wendo, who almost left, it seemed, in January, has ultimately stayed and is producing some of his best forms since he made that move to Ren. I think that after that loan spell he had at Lons, you know, everyone was thinking he'd really push on and then he, he's not really d- quite done that at Ren, but he's starting to do so now. There's a red you know, you could go through so many players, you know, Borrego even as well, you know, slightly deeper, but still incredibly influential and, and creative as well. So I think that, you know, they can definitely threaten PSG because we've spoken about their defence. We've spoken about the fact that Luis Enrique is potentially having to play Beraldo more than he would perhaps want. You know, you need that kind of time to adapt to European football when you come from Brazil. And he's not really had that. He's been, you know, through no fault of his own. Uh, had to be thrown in the deep end a little bit with all these injuries around him. So I think that there are weaknesses to exploit. And I think that Ren had the means to exploit them as well. But uh, it's difficult to see anything other than a PSG victory, given how strong they have been at home this season. And given the fact that, as I say, they can prepare their their game weeks, you know, every every week and prepare their schedule towards success in these two competitions. Indeed, but PSG will have to look out for Martin Terra, who did score a beauty of a goal at the weekend. And it's nice to see... Martin Terrier back. You're listening to Andy Scott, Luke Entwistle, myself, Andrea Servagora on Le Bosier. It's the official League and podcast in English. Any questions, comments, or suggestions, League and podcast at gmail.com. That's L I G U E one podcast at gmail.com. Happy to hear from you, and we'll do our best to give you everything you need. So things will be going well for Ligue 1's three remaining European teams. PSG beating Real Sociedad, Marseille getting the better of Villarreal and Lille cruising past Sturm Graz. All three now are in the quarterfinals of their respective competitions, which has done Ligue 1's UEFA index ranking a world of good. More of that in a minute. First, PSG Barcelona. We've already talked about that amazing comeback. Of course, the coach that night was Luis Enrique. Remember, PSG won the first match 4 0 in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, before that 6 1 uh, match at the Camp Nou. Uh, Barcelona, look, they're not the Barcelona of five, 10 years ago, Andy. This match will not be at the Camp Nou. We should say there's some real youngsters in that Barcelona team, right? There was a 16 year old, 17 year old, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and you alluded to this before. I, I agree. I think the favourites are Real Madrid, Man City, and Bayern Munich. They're all in the other half. Let's not get ahead of ourselves too much. 
well, what do PSG have to do against Barcelona? <laughs> I think there might be some goals in this one. What do you think? Well, I mean, I think we've got to be careful because I, I think, you know, P- I mean, we, first of all, the thing is PSG have got Mbappe and Mbappe is clearly in the moods uh, in the Champions League as he showed in that game in San Sebastian in the, in the second leg against Real Sociedad. And if they can, if they can tailor everything towards him, and I think everybody in Spain realises that, that they, they could be in trouble, you know, and obviously the, the, the whole Madrid half of Spain, as it were, will be, will be hoping that Mbappe um, crucifies Barcelona in that tie. Um, but otherwise, if you, if you take him out of it, I mean, I thought Barcelona played well against Napoli in the second leg. They played very well last night against Atletico Madrid. They've got lots of problems, Barcelona. They're off the pace at the top of La Liga. They're a long way behind Real Madrid. But they've got good players, you know. And, and you mentioned the young guys, Lamin Yamal and Pau Kubarsi, look incredible. They're not the only ones. They've, they have got depth in that squad. They have got players who've done it before in the Champions League. As a club, they have the experience. You know, PSG have got to be careful, um, especially with all the, the issues that PSG undoubtedly have. Of course, Luis Enrique's knowledge of Barcelona can only be helpful to, to Paris Saint-Germain. But... I, I think PSG um, are probably the slight favourites, I think, but I, I think it's close. And I think the other thing we have to bear in mind here is, of course, you know, I'm saying I'm saying there, and you're agreeing that they're in the in the best half of the draw. You know, you never know what's going to happen, but I can I can easily picture a scenario whereby PSG beat Barcelona and everybody becomes everybody in France becomes euphoric and gets a bit carried away. And then they lose to Atletico in the semi-finals. That that type of thing is a big possibility. You know, the Champions League. You're talking about the the very elite, the very top level of the game. It's not easy. Um, so you know, PSG have got a long way to go. They've got a lot of work to do. They've got the attacking players to take on anybody. As we've mentioned, it's not just Mbappe. It's Usman Dembele. It's it's Bradley Barcola who looks quite comfortable at that level. Lots of other creative players who can make an impact. Is the balance right? for the very biggest games in Europe against the very best opposition? That's the big question. They've got to sort that out in the next few weeks. And I just, my my only slight concern is that Barcelona, just from the basis of the last couple of games, because they've got a lot of issues which have come to the fore throughout the season, but the last couple of games, they've looked pretty spot on. And and, and they've, they've got to be aware that this might not be the Barcelona of old. It might not be the team of Messi, Neymar, Luis Suarez and all the rest of them. But they have got, the likes of Lewandowski and, and 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 all the rest of them who've got great experience, great talent, and and it will be it will be a fantastic tie. Yeah, I mean, obviously, any match in the quarterfinals of the Champions League these days is going to be an extremely hard game. You're going to have to be at your best. It's an old cliche, but it's true. We should say for PSG fans, there was that measure of revenge. Uh, what three seasons ago when they went and won four one. Uh, at Barcelona with Kylian Mbappe just on fire, scoring a hat-trick, I believe, in, in a 5-2 aggregate win. There was one one draw back in, in Paris. Um, how do you see this, Luke, for, for, for PSG? What are going to be the, the key factors in, in getting past this Barcelona team? Yeah, I mean, we, we've already spoken about it, but Mbappe probably. I mean, it, it's quite funny, you know, he doesn't really need to move to La Liga next season. You know, he's already beaten Sociedad. He'll have a go against Barcelona, could have... <laughs> Let's go Madrid in the semi final. It's almost like he's already playing in La Liga, and of course, he will be next season. And his determination to win this Champions League in his final season, you know, he's, he's someone who, from a very, very young age, has been obsessed with records and obsessed with writing his name in, in history, uh, as Pelle did, uh, notably. And I think that, you know, his motivation to win a Champions League with his hometown club is, is huge. You know, whether or not there's the quality around him to do it is another thing. I think we've not really spoken about him, but Vitinha, who People don't talk about too much and there's always talk about reinforcing the midfield, but he's been excellent this season. was absolutely incredible, I thought, against Montpellier last night, but has performed extremely well, I think, consistently throughout the season and is clearly a player that Luis Enrique really, really liked. So I think that regardless of you know further recruitment in that, in that area, I think that he has his place in, in that team. And I think that he could be potentially a key player keeping things ticking against Barcelona because I think that midfield battle will be one that's difficult to win. Um, but, you know, while on one side there's motivation you know, to win it with Mbappe in the side, I think there's the motivation on Barcelona's side to win something with Xavi, who obviously will leave at the end of the season. Uh, you know, will that gal- galvanise the team? Will that galvanise Barcelona? Um, it remains to be seen. But, yeah, you know, there's, there's high, high, high motivation for both of these clubs to go and run. I, I agree with, with Andy that PSG are ever so slight favourites. But 
I think there's going to be a few key individual battles. Uh, I think that, you know, how Mbappe fares, I think how Lewandowski fares against Beraldo. I think that could be something that Barcelona decide to decide to target. I think how those individual battles go, I think will dictate who ultimately wins uh, that two-legged tie. Indeed. And you're right to point out Vitinha, who's maybe gone a little bit under the radar. Maybe we should talk about him a little bit more in another pod. I think only uh, Luca Hernandez has played has played in more matches for PSG this season than Vitinha. He's He really has been one of the constants of this season. And as you say, super goal uh, over the weekend against Montpellier. As Andy pointed out, Atletico Madrid or Dortmund awaits in the semi-finals. Well, what about Marseille? We talked about the, that match uh, squeezing through against Villa Real. Up against the Portuguese giants, Benfica, uh, with Angel Di Maria, uh, former PSG player, of course, and he's returned to um, to France. I seem to remember him scoring a hat-trick for Juventus against Nantes um, a season or two ago in the Europa League. Uh, you seem pretty confident about their chances. I, I spoke with an ex-colleague of ours, actually, who covers Portuguese football quite a lot, and he, he was... He rated Benfica pretty highly, and we, we, we Marseille at the moment it's quite a fragile um, outfit. What are going to be the keys in that match? You're fairly confident, are you, Marseille against Benfica, Andy? Well, I mean, I think that I, I would just say that Benfica, you know, I think they were, if I'm right in saying, I think they were quarter finalists in the Champions League last season. I think if you compare them to to then, there's been a bit of a drop off. You know, they're not top of the league in Portugal. They had a, a very poor Champions League campaign this season. They went out in the group stage. They, I wouldn't say they made heavy weather of beating Toulouse, but they didn't easily beat Toulouse and then they edged out Rangers in the last 16. I, I don't think they are, right now, I don't think they're a, a huge European force. I just meant in the sense of the potential opponents. If you look at the teams that Marseille could have got, obviously they could have got Liverpool, they could have got Milan, they could have got Roma, uh, they could have got Bayer Leverkusen, they could have got a, a tougher tie than than Benfica, you don't expect. There are no easy games, Andreas, at this stage of the competition. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think that it's possibly about as kind a draw as they could have hoped for. Um, the other thing is, I mean, if they go to Lisbon and they get a result which keeps them in the tie to bring back to the Velodrome, it's worth bearing in mind that Marseille have not lost a game at home all season in all competitions. You know, they, they, were, they, they, they lost on penalties to Panathinaikos in the Champions League third qualifying round at the Velodrome, but they've not lost a game there at all this season. And, you know, you can imagine if they're still in the tie with 65,000 people at the Velodrome for the return leg, it's going to be quite an atmosphere roaring them on. So if they if, if they are fresh, if they if they have everybody fit, uh, if they're in a position to go to go on and win the tie in the return, I think they've got a chance. And of course, it's a, it's a, it's a tie which evokes so many memories for, for French people because if you go back to 1990, the European Cup semi-final, uh, Marseille, that, that great Marseille team which was emerging at that point, of course, with Chris Waddle, as you discussed on the podcast recently, coming up against Benfica, who, who won the tie to get through to the final because of a, a highly controversial goal by Vata uh, in the second leg in Lisbon, which, which by all accounts was scored with his hand. Um, so, you know, it, it brings back so much history, uh, so many memories for, for the people of Marseille, for the supporters of, of OM, and, and they'll be determined to to avenge that defeat. And and I think they have a chance. I just think they have a chance. I'm not saying that they're the favourites necessarily, but I think they have a chance. Um, and I think that that would be a fantastic achievement for them. I just I just don't know if I can see them going any further, even if they do get beyond that, that quarterfinal. I think it would be a huge ask for them to get to another Europa League final. Yeah, I, I can confirm Marseille fans still, what, 34 years later, haven't quite swallowed that that late Benfica winner. It, it, was, it was one of those goals that's etched in the, in the, in the Marseille memory. Uh, we should say that uh, the teams have met as recent, well, not, not that recently, 2010, Marseille losing 3-2 on aggregate. First leg at the Stadio de Luz on the 11th of April. Second leg a week later in Marseille, you say, Andy, Liverpool and Ad- At- or Atalanta in the semis. We all like the look of the Europa League uh, this season. There's some really good teams in there. Look forward to that. What about Lille? Um, Luke, we have to say first history for Lille in the quarterfinals of a European competition for the first time. Uh, Aston Villa, that's probably the toughest match they could have got. Villa really are um, doing exceptionally well this season under Unai Emery, uh, fourth in the Premier League. How do you rate Lille's chances? 
I, I think they have a, a pretty good chance, to be honest. I agree that, you know, this is the, the final before the final. I think that whoever wins this tie should go on to win the rest of the competition. I think that they're comfortably the two. Ooh, Andy doesn't think so. <laughs> Maybe he's thinking Fenner, Fenner Bash. I don't, I don't know. But I, I, think, I think that the two sides, I think they're the two strongest. But I, I think that they have a good chance. I think that notably, obviously, Jonathan David is, bar Mbappe, the most informed striker in Europe's top five divisions in 2024. I think that is very important. And I think it's, you know, what a contrast to the start of the season. Remember how poor he was in the first few months of the season and how we, you know, it came to November and you know, the, the international break came up. And I remember Olivier Lietong being in the, uh, the president at Lille, being in the, the mix zone post-match. He says, you know, It'll just be good for him to get away, just see if he can score a few goals with Canada, come back and hopefully score a few with us too. And, and that's exactly what happened. And he's been, you know, in red hot form, another goal at the weekend as well against Brest. So I think that he could be the difference maker. But, you know, it's a very talented side that is a little bit inconsistent. I think that's very fair to say. I think, you know, if you have David, Angel Gomez, Kebea, uh, you've got Bentaleb, Jagrova, Euro, Chevalier, if all of those are on their, you know, on their A game on the day, I think that this is a very, very close, a very, very close time. And I think it'll be a very interesting one. I, I think it's a little bit too close to call. Um, I think that either of these sides could go through and I think that either side could potentially go on to win the whole thing. And it will be a, a great day out for Lille, a quarterfinal in a European competition. Not too far. They just got to get on the Euro star and then get on the, the train up to Birmingham, that's on the 11th of <laughs> April. And the semis, uh, as you say, uh, Fenerbahce against Olympiakos. That is going to be a hot semi-final Fenerbahce of Turkey. Olympiakos, not of Athens, of Piraeus. Let's get that right because I know our Greek fans will point that out. They're not an Athenian team. Andy? Andres, you, you, will, you will know this, of course, with uh, Greece being very close to your heart. The, the final is in Athens. Correct. And you have Olympiakos and Pauk who could both get to the final and meet each other. So... I, I think I think Luke is getting a bit carried away to suggest that Lille <laughs> should be the uh, uh, if it's not Villa, it's going to be Lille that wins the competition. I, I mean, Fiorentina still in there as well. I I I, th- I agree that Lille have lots of talented players. I think they're a fantastic team when it's all clicking, but I, I'm just very conscious of of how difficult it is for French teams to go the extra step in Europe. And I'd love to prove wrong, yeah. but. I think there are so many obstacles potentially in the way for Lille as there are for all the other teams that you know. I think there's a long way to go. You're right. The final is is in Greece. I mean, Lille obviously will be hoping to 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 travel to Greece in May for that final. And we should say, and I've been surprised. Just a very quick one. I don't know what you think, Andy. I, I've been surprised at the Conference League because when it when it I mean, it's a new competition, obviously, but I, it's turned out to be more interesting than I think. And I know a couple of West Ham fans, and and their victory really has given the club a boost. Have, have you been a bit surprised about how high profile the Conference League has become a hand porn is to to teams, or are you expecting it? No, I think I think that one of the issues is that the Champions League now is so, you know, the, I mean, there is a little bit of variety in the Champions League. Like only three of the teams that got to the quarterfinals of the Champions League last year have made it back there this year. But in general, there it's so difficult for anybody out with a group of twelve to fifteen teams to have any prospects in the Champions League. That's why you get a situation whereby the Europa League becomes, you know, this really fantastic competition with the big teams who've missed out and with some teams who've fallen a bit short in the Champions League. And then there is just a drop down from that to the Europa Conference League. I think a lot of pretty big clubs in big leagues who would have no chance of winning the Champions League whatsoever, who might not have made it into the Europa League, but you know they, they realise it's a chance to win a trophy. West Ham did that and, and Aston Villa might think the same thing. And, and Lille and other French clubs should be thinking that as well. But, you know, this is the thing. There's, there's clubs in, in major European leagues who see this as a chance and when they've got the financial muscle of the Premier League, a, a team like Aston Villa, um, perhaps an Italian team like Fiorentina, it, it, they then become the big favourites. And that's why a club like Lille, with their lack of uh, European history, I mean, these things actually do count for something. I think it's sometimes quite difficult to really put your finger on it, but Lille do not have that past in Europe, that history in European competition, which might, which may just have given them an edge. And yeah, in general, it's a fantastic competition. It's, it's an open competition. And I think there's several teams still involved in, in the Europa Conference League who could, um, who could well win it. So let's hope it's Lille, but fingers crossed. Indeed, that's going to be a great match. And, and, uh, uh, Jonathan Johnson of this parish will not forgive me if I don't mention, of course, Aston Villa, former European champions. So, you know, there's some real pedigree, uh, in that competition. 
And of course, just going back, Marseille against Benfica, that's the clash between two former European champions as well. So lots to look forward to in European football. Well, let's move on to the uh, UEFA coefficient. It's for one of our favourite subjects, isn't it, Luke and Andy? Uh, but it is important this year. And we've had a, a question, uh, our question of the week. We get a few questions in, and this was the one that got through the net. It's from uh, Henry Bethel. Uh, what does the UEFA League coefficient mean for French football? Will an extra Champions League spot make a big difference for the French League? Will Liga able to maintain the fifth spot through Lille, Marseille and PSG? Well, I'll, I can start by saying... Yes to the last question. Uh, France will get four teams in the Champions League next year, the expanded Champions League, uh, thanks to the performances this year. They are the fifth best performing country in Europe. Uh, what it means for French football, I I'll, I'll throw this over to you guys because I think it's really interesting. I mean, there's a bit of background and just my personal view. I think French teams have lacked a little bit of certainty to invest because up until now, there are only two teams guaranteed to be in the Champions League, right, from, from Liga. It can be two or three, depending on the playoff. If you say PSG is one of them, that means only one. there's only really one spot to get in the Champions League for the rest of the league. Uh, if, you are f if there are four teams that are guaranteed to be there, I think it might be an incentive for other teams to invest. As an example, this year, Lens, uh, 52 million euros uh, brought in from their Champions League performance. And they didn't even go through. You know, they obviously were, were, were eliminated, not going through to the last 16. So 52 million euros is a lot of money. And if you can build that into your business plan, I think it might encourage teams maybe to invest a little bit more and to at least have that bit of financial, financial stability. So going back to those questions, first, Andy, what, uh, what does this UEFA coefficient mean for French football? And I think the key thing is, what does it mean for French clubs and the French league if the top four are getting in the Champions League? Well, on, on, a, on, a, very, on a very basic, simple level that you touched on, it's an extra place for French clubs. I mean, I mean obviously, the, the Champions League is expanding. Uh, next season, it will feature 36 teams instead of 32 now. It's going to be a, a league. It's, it's, it, it sounds quite complicated, but perhaps it's not as complicated as it's been made out to be. But essentially, there is no more groups of four teams. It's one league of 36 teams. Every team involved in it plays eight games against a different opponent every time, all of which will be worked out, of course, uh, when there is a draw at the beginning of next season. But that means the expansion of the Champions League means there are extra places to, to hand out. And the team that sits in fifth place in UEFA's uh, coefficient ranking system based on the performances of each country, the, 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 the representatives of each country, France are in fifth place, so they're behind, you know, the the big four: the, the English Premier League, La Liga in Spain, Serie A in Italy, and the German Bundesliga. They are the top four teams. Those nations all get four guaranteed places in the Champions League group stage. Number five on the list, which for next season will be France, and for the season after, I think we can say now with certainty is going to be France as well. They get three guaranteed places in the group stage plus one that enters in the third qualifying round. So that is that is up from what it has been now, where, as you said, you had two guaranteed places and the team in third entered in the qualifying rounds. And that was always an obstacle. I can't even remember the last time that the, the French team that had to enter in the qualifying rounds actually came through them and got into the, the group stage. There have been incidences where France has been handed a third group stage place because of the winner of the Europa League Um having already qualified, it's a bit complicated, but essentially they didn't have to go through the qualifying rounds. But when they've had to, they've tended to, to fall short like Marseille did at the beginning of this season. So now you have that extra place. So as you say, the consequences are positive because they have more guaranteed money coming in. They can plan differently in the summer. And it drops down um, through the league because France then, of course, has, has an extra place in European competition on the whole. As a result, it still gets its two Europa League spots and it's one place in the Europa Conference League. So there are more European places to go around. Um, and having more money to invest, more guaranteed money to invest, should make them more competitive. So hopefully it stays that way. Right now, of course, France is, is in fifth position. There is theoretically the opportunity to climb up uh, even higher, get into the top four in the ranking. But they're a long way away from that, and it looks like that's not going to happen anytime soon for them. It's all about making sure they ward off the, the, the nations, the leagues behind them, which, of course, is... Most obviously is the Portuguese League and the Dutch League. Those are the two leagues who've, who've competed best with them in the past. This time around, we know for next season they have the four places 
and we were waiting to see, and Luke perhaps can confirm this to me because I have a doubt now entering my mind, but I think we were just waiting on PSV Eindhoven losing against Dortmund last week, which they did. Ajax went out as well, and that means that for the season after next, France will also have four places. Is that right, Luke? I'm not, I'm not making that up. Yeah, no, that's right. That is right. So yeah, there's some guarantees, uh, I suppose, which I think, you know, you're talking about will teams invest. I think that if it was one season and then there was behind that a bit of uncertainty as to whether it would reduce back down to three, I think you'd maybe have a few clubs slightly reticent to uh, put in big money. But since there's a two-year guarantee there, you know, we could see a bit of an interesting transfer window where teams really kind of go for it. I think it was, Andreas, you said in, in the chat about you did the the, the, the maths and just said, you know, 39% of league and clubs will be in some form of European competition. I think, you know, that massively incentivizes some mid-table clubs who think, you know, we're probably not going to be threatened by relegation, but we're not really challenging for Europe previously. We'll now maybe invest that a little bit more just to try and break that, that, that ceiling and just about get into that, you know, conference or Europa League position. So I think... I think, you know, you, it's all been alluded to, but I think it does slightly shift the dynamics potentially in terms of spending in the and going forward. Just, um, I, think, I think there's an important thing to point out about this, this because, because fourth place will enter in the qualifying rounds and obviously you want to get behind whoever that team is. I, I can see a problem for, for French football for having that fourth place, which might be, and this is nothing against Brest, okay? Brest having a tremendous season, but let's say Brest finish fourth. Are they realistically going to make it to the Champions League group stage? Are they realistically going to win two ties in the qualifying rounds to get to the group stage? Bearing in mind, this is a small club who it looks like they're not going to be able to play European games in their own stadium, which is which is um, decrepit. Is that a fair way of describing it? The Stade yeah, Pontis Le yeah. they they're in the process of building, well, they're at the, the beginning of a process of, of constructing a new stadium on the edge of town. Their president, who's a prominent local businessman, uh, you guys may have seen it in an interview in, in the Big Sports Daily Le Keep over the weekend where he basically said, I think the question was directly put to him, you know, will you invest more money if you get into to Europe next season? And he essentially said no. Um, and they're going to lose a couple of big players because that's what always happens to any French club be, below PSG when they have a good season. They will lose a couple of players. They may be a weaker squad next season. So, you know, it would be great for them if they get into Europe in some form or another. But the, the issue that I... I I see potentially happening is that they finish fourth and then they have no chance of getting through to the Champions League group stage and then France is unable to take advantage of that extra place potentially being up for grabs. And it might not only be them, right? There might be other teams who will yeah. fall short, of course, but they are clearly the least well-equipped to, to, to go on and progress in Europe next season. So I, I hope that if it is them, they can do it. But that is one issue which may arise. Well, that leads to a bugbear of mine because the problem for me is that the transfer deadline is just after that last playoff match, isn't it? So clubs can't really plan. They don't know how much money they got in the bank. So if you get into the Champions League, suddenly you've got this money and then you can buy players, but then the transfer deadline is within a few days. You're absolutely right about Brest. That I didn't see that interview you were talking about, but I saw an interview with Gregory Lorenzi, their sporting director, and he was asked the same question. He said, look... We, and he could have said I, because he's done an amazing job. He's taken breaths from the amateur leagues. We have planned for this club to be between 10th in Liga and 5th in Ligue 2 in terms of infrastructure, investment, money, the lot. And this is just a great bonus for us. Um, but as things stand, looking at the title, uh, they could certainly be in the top four. They could be in the top three. If, if they're guaranteed to be in the Champions League, watch this space, because that will be fascinating. But um, it's a really interesting question from from Henry Bethel. Thanks for that. And we'll definitely revisit that, um, the impact of this expanded Champions League on Ligue 1. Check out Ligue 1.com for all the top flight news from France with an abundance of highlights, match previews, stories and features to scratch any Ligue 1 itch. Ligue 1.com. As PSG look to secure a place in the Champions League semis against eternal foes Barcelona, we take you back to a time when no one was used to seeing the Capital Club knocking around at the business end of the European season. A time when a rough diamond from the little-known footballing nation of Liberia burst onto the league and scene, and with a trademark combination of explosive talent, hard work and humility, rose to the very top of the world game and helped shape its future. Even though he won plenty of titles, awards and trophies, it could very well be argued that his greatest achievement came outside the world of football. 
That's right, we're talking about certified Liga legend and former president of Liberia, Mr. George Weyer. The term rags to riches is one of the most overused in sport, but it could have been written for George Weyer. Born and raised in a shanty town in one of the poorest countries in the world, the Liberian went on to star for Monaco and Paris Saint-Germain. Weyer didn't just score goals and win trophies. He's widely regarded as a prototype for the modern-day striker. Fast, strong, blessed with great technique and able to operate in and out of the box. And if that wasn't enough, after hanging up his boots, Weyer returned to Liberia to be elected as his country's president. Truly a unique story in the history of football. Born in 1966, Weyer was raised in desperate poverty with 12 brothers and sisters by his grandmother in the capital, Monrovia. Not only was life tough, but Liberia had no football pedigree and in the 1980s was well off the radar of football's African scouts. Making ends meet by working as a phone switchboard operator, the young Weyer started scoring goals in the Liberian league. Age 20, he was signed by a Cameroonian club, Tone Allende. That's when Weyer got his big break. Frenchman Claude Loire was coach of the national Cameroon team and on a trip home crossed paths with Arsene Wenger. Loire couldn't contain his enthusiasm for the barely known Weyer. Monaco coach Wenger trusted his old friend and in the spring of 1988 was on a flight to Cameroon. In surely the biggest Ligue 1 transfer bargain of all time, the new French champion snapped up the 21-year-old for an equivalent of 15,000 euros. What's more, a magical relationship was born between Wenger and Weyer. Success didn't come easily. There can hardly be a bigger culture shock than trading deprived Monrovia for the millionaire's playground of Monte Carlo. Monaco legend Luc Sonor described Weyer's first training session. It was a catastrophe. The players were telling each other that this must be some kind of mistake. Weyer couldn't pass or dribble. We asked the boss if this was some kind of joke. Arsene took us to one side and said, listen, this guy is a phenomenon. What followed was a series of intense individual training sessions that turned raw talent into a league and sensation. Weyer didn't speak a word of French, so this homesick English speaker was grateful for the welcome of English teammates Glenn Hoddle and Mark Haightley. Any fears were allayed on the 4th of October 1988. An extraordinary goal in the second leg of the European Cup first round. Haightley was injured against Velo Rakovic and Weyer stepped in. With the aggregate score at 1-1, Weyer collects the ball near the centre spot. He spins past two bemused defenders and hits a 40-metre shot of such ferocity that the visiting keeper hardly moves. The Weyer legend is born. Weyer bagged 14 goals in his first season at Monaco and was crowned African Footballer of the Year, a huge event in his native Liberia. In 1991, he won the Coupe de France with Monaco. The next season, Monaco reached the final of the Cup Winners' Cup. The man nicknamed Mr. George was at his most prolific, hitting 18 league goals as Monaco were picked to the title by Marseille. Bitterly disappointed at coming so close to silverware, Weyer moved on. Rejecting suitors from around Europe, he signed for Paris Saint-Germain. That first season in the capital yielded 14 goals and a triumph in the Coupe de France. That success was a springboard for a Ligue 1 title in 1994. Weyer starring in a fabulous team alongside the likes of Rai, Valdo, David Ginola and Bernard Lama. The next season, Weyer was top scorer in the Champions League with seven goals, including an individual effort at Bayern Munich that's gone down in PSG folklore. George, on a écarté avec Numa, George encore. Oh, il est passé. Il est passé. Oh, il est passé. Oh, quel but. Oh, il est passé. Oh, quel, quel but. but. Oh, quel oh, but. George, oh, oh, on sentait qu'il était capable. Ça pourrait être passé, il est passé. Oh, il est passé. Quel oh, but. Oui. Quel festival, George Weah. Ah, ça, c'est un festival. 1995 brought a seemingly endless array of individual honors. Weyer became the first African to win the FIFA Player of the Year and the Ballon d'Or. But Weyer never forgot Wenger, dedicating his FIFA award to his old Monaco boss. I want you to keep this. This is for me, but I want you to keep it because he deserves this more than I do. Thanks, Mr. Coach, for everything. Alors, uh, this is the man. 
I remember it was, George, work hard, you're going to be a great player. And when I came to Europe, he was like a father to me. Every time I goes on the field, and I was playing for Arsene Wenger, I wanted him to know that what he have done for me, this is the way I could pay him. So I could break my knee, my, my face, my hand for him, just to win a game. He took care of me like a son. You know, and I couldn't believe it. Because when racism was at the peak, Arsene taught me that a black man and a white man can live together. By then, Wire had launched a stellar career at AC Milan before finishing his career at Marseille. It was a measure of the respect for Wire that previous allegiances to PSG were forgotten. Few footballers left such a legacy as Wire. For Africans, he's an icon, the first player from the continent to achieve global status and still the only African winner of the Ballon d'Or or FIFA Player of the Year. Wire was popular for his generosity. For years, he funded the penniless Liberia national team, which came within a whisker of qualifying for the 2002 World Cup. In Paris, Wire would often knock on the door of PSG president Michel Denisot, asking for more money. Not for him, but for youngsters who just signed their first contract. The Wire name lives on in football, son Timothy launching a successful career at PSG in Lille and playing for the US national team. But during his glory years in Europe, Weyer never forgot the bloody civil wars that rampaged in his homeland. Frustrated at the lack of international attention, he returned to become Liberia's president between 2018 and 2024, a crowning achievement for a true African trailblazer. So that's the story of George Weyer. And um, for me, it was personally a, a really interesting story to look into because I did see, I'm showing my age here, uh, George Weyer play. And it was a memorable match for me because it was the first time I ever actually saw a football match outside of England. Uh, it was PSG against Arsenal. I went as a fan in 1994. It was a Cup Winners' Cup semi-final. George Weyer was there with a, a great PSG team. Uh, David Ginola scored a goal. And, uh, you know, for me, it, it was just uh, like opening my eyes to a new kind of football, European atmosphere. And George Weyer really was uh, just a huge presence in in football uh, in France and then around the world. Uh, Luke, I mean, Monaco have had so many great players come through that club. George Weyer, does he? Is there still any resonance there at Monaco for uh, the, the days of George Weyer at Monaco? Yeah, I mean, he's you know one of the the all time classic players to have played for for AS Monaco. He was. Actually, there I think it, within the past year um, at the training centre, lots of the former legends have, have passed through their new training centre since it's been built uh, in the Turbine. You know, I, I remember I, I was unaware, but I, I turned up on this particular day. Uh, I think it was for a, for a press conference or an event or something, uh, and and kind of turn up in my little Skoda Fabia and, and turn to, to to go to the car park and see you know presidential cars there, thinking what's going on. So. You know he's um you know still still a very big figure at Monaco as he still is in world football in general as well. And although this is a uh, league and podcast, I would point our listeners to what for me is the greatest ever individual goal I've ever seen. Uh, look it up on YouTube. It was Verona against Milan. Uh, George Weah literally running the length of the pitch to score an outstanding goal. Look that one up. A highlight for the great George Weah. The thing about the thing about George Weah is that you know for for me the and this this come this comes into this comes into a discussion that we have had with with other members of the pod in recent times talking about Ligue 1 and 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 its exposure internationally and 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 how it can develop that at a time when it's trying to sell the international television rights. The 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 thing is that when French football was at its most glamorous, you might say in the early nineties, the mid nineties, when they had George Weah at PSG, when PSG were doing well in the Champions League and and the Cup Winners' Cup, and when they had Waddle at Marseille just before that. Um, the thing was that you couldn't watch the French League on, on UK TV, but you could watch the Italian League, and that's what made Serie A become this um, such a powerful thing for, for football fans of my generation, um, and broadly speaking, I think of all of, you know, of, 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 all of us, for all of us, really. Um, and so my memories of George Weah are linked to, to him playing for AC Milan and scoring that absolutely ridiculous solo goal against Verona right at the beginning. It was, I think it was like the first day of the season, wasn't it, in, in 1996 or something, where he's kind of setting off on this run 
And uh, a bit like Maradona somehow sometimes used to be kind of players attacking him from all angles and him somehow managing to stay on his feet and keep going, keep going. Just astonishing. And of course, French football fans had been used to seeing George Weah work his magic for some time. But but those of us who were not living in France, who were growing up elsewhere, we hadn't seen so much of George Weah. And, and then he does that. Now it's time for the French football quiz that has listeners interrogating themselves, family members, random French people, and of course the internet in a bid to win a stunning Liga Uber Eats jersey each month. How does it work? Well, it's simple. You correctly identify the current or former Liga star I'm talking about and then let us know. Get it right and you go into the running for the aforementioned jersey. This month it comes courtesy of none other than Stade de Reims Maltese player Teddy Tuma. So today I'm bringing you the second clue for March. Make sure to get your answers in to league podcast at gmail.com. L-I-G-U-E one podcast at gmail.com. Here we go. Who am I? Spotted as a 16-year-old by Bordeaux, I signed my first professional contract with Le Girondin, but only played two matches for them over three years, heading out on loan with two different clubs for three seasons. A first transfer saw me finally play regular league and football, earn me a first overseas move. After two successful years west of France, I returned to Ligue 1, playing sparingly before another two seasons on loan, first across the channel before moving east. After four seasons in the east, I headed southeast before arriving in the Middle East. With a century of international caps, my career also features plenty of silverware, including two continental triumphs, a Coupe de France, a Coupe de la Ligue, and two other National Cup crowns. My career is not yet finished. Who am I and what do I have in common with the player from our latest clue? If you have it, send answers to league1podcast at gmail.com and get into the running for that Teddy Tuma jersey. Luke, there's one uh, little phrase that jumps out at me there, a century of international caps. That's quite a, an exclusive club. Don't give anything away, but you think you might have it. I think I've got a better chance than I usually do of having it. I have a few suspic- a few suspicions, but I'm not sure if I'm I'm for hundred percent got it. This is this is Robbie Thompson's work. I should say it's not me, Andy. You, hey, I think there's a gleam in your eye. I think you know who it is. Oh, it's obviously Ali Day, isn't it? The great Iranian. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks for supporting the podcast. If you're enjoying it, leave us with a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to tell your friends. Well, next up, we've got two very important rounds of football, gentlemen, uh, rounds 27 and 28. First up, and this is always a really interesting match, uh, Andy, Lille against Lens. Uh, It is a local derby. Uh, Two clubs are not the closest in the league. I think Nice and Monaco are slightly closer, but there's a real rivalry up there. And these are two teams who, you know, they'll look at the last uh, set of match days and if they can put some form together, there could be Champions League for both of these two teams. A lot at stake, Lille against Lens, Andy. Yeah, there is there is a huge amount at stake. Um, Obviously, you know, Lens had that defeat at the weekend against Nice, which has set them back somewhat in the um, in the race for Champions League qualification, but it's very tight between uh, all those teams. There is no love lost between Lille and Lens, that's for sure. Their fans uh, do not like each other much. We've unfortunately seen that spill over um, so at least one occasion in the last in the last few years in the stands. Um, the stakes are really high, and you know there's been a couple of I think the last two meetings between the teams have ended in draws. Lille with home advantage. Lille are very very strong at home. Um, and Lens are usually strongest at home, albeit they've had they've had a few defeats actually at home in the league in in 2024. But you know, Lille having home advantage that might just swing it. But the, the stakes are really big. It, it's a, it's a great game. There will be a, a full house at the um, at the Stade Pierre Morois or whatever they call it these days. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, it, it should be a real cracker because you know the thing is that Lille play. I, I keep saying this every time I'm on the podcast. Lille play really tremendous football, and uh, sometimes mm. I think they underachieve a little bit. For the quality of football that they play, they don't always get the results that they should get with the way they play under Paulo Fonseca. Lens, you know, have done tremendous things under Franck Ez going back over the last few years. It's a clash of styles in many ways, you know, different tactical systems. I think that's a really interesting game to watch. And I think Friday evenings, you know, often there's not too much competition in terms of other matches to watch around Europe. 
Um, if you're at home and you know you're in another country and you don't maybe watch French football all the time, this is this this would be a tremendous uh, introduction to it. Uh, it should be a cracker. And certainly, if you're in Canada, Jonathan David has been in brilliant form. He started off a bit slowly this season, but since that winter break, he's been unstoppable, scoring another goal over the weekend. We're bookmarking that weekend. Uh, Luke Marseille PSG. PSG have dominated this fixture of late, but Marseille did get a win in Paris in 2021 season. They dumped PSG out of uh, the cup a couple of seasons ago. Is it going to be a case of trying to rely on that amazing atmosphere at the Velodrome and and PSG maybe thinking about Europe? What's Marseille's game plan here, Luke? Yeah, I think that's exactly it. I mean, Marseille are obviously having a a mediocre season. Uh, It could be a great season if they go deeper into the Europa League, but that atmosphere at the velodrome has steered them across the line on quite a few occasions still unbeaten at the velodrome i think that is important um i think that as you say psg it could be a case of uh la tête ailleurs as they say you know the heads just being on on europe and and on the coup de france as well you know huge pitches coming up but look you know th- this fixture means so much to psg as it does to marseille so i i think this could be a rare occasion where we do see mbappe uh, starting, um, which is an incredible thing to say, but I, I think that they will really put all their eggs into that basket. You know, it's their first game back after the international break, and I think it can kind of set a trend. You know, if you come back from the international break after two weeks away, and then you start with a loss and a loss against your biggest rivals, I think that that is a bad omen going forward for those more important, in quotation marks, kind of bigger games coming up. So I think that PSG will will be set up and going for a win. I, I think it'll be a tight one, uh, but I think that PSG could have the means to, to just scrape over the line. Andy, you've covered plenty of uh, Le Classiques over the years. What one, one thing that occurred to me is this is a more French uh, PSG team, isn't it, of, of late bringing in the likes of Barcola and Dembele and the others we've talked about. They're going to understand what this means to the PSG fans, right? Even if there's probably not going to be any PSG fans no. in Marseille. Do, do you see any chance for for Marseille? I mean, is there anything they could do to disrupt them? Are they going to really go for it? I mean, Montpellier really tried to kind of close PSG down and attack PSG. Is it attack the best form of defence or is that just one of those old cliches that's complete nonsense? Well, I think dri- driven on by the by the huge support of the Velodrome and the passion of the crowd, that, that might inspire them to, to play that way. And I think... Um, Jean-Louis Gasset will, will get the players up for it. Obviously, he, he's a former Paris Saint-Germain uh, assistant coach under Laurent Blanc very recently. He's got, the, he's got that, that past with PSG. He, he will know what this fixture means and will be able to transmit that to, to any players who, who might not have experienced it before. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's a tricky one. I mean, you, you mentioned the game they won in the Cup. It was last season. I, I was actually there. I commentated on it and it was a tremendous, tremendous night, the Velodrome. But those, have been, those occasions have been so rare. I think I'm right in saying that that is only the third time that Marseille had beaten PSG since the since the Qatari takeover in 2011. They beat them in 2011 at the Velodrome. They won in the in the COVID you know the the in the COVID season at the Parc des Princes when there was hardly any spectators. I think there was more players yep. sent off in that game than there were, there were spectators five, in the stands. I think there were five sent off, right? Yeah. A lot of them right at the end, yeah, but there were so hardly they, any players left on the pitch. Yeah. So they won that game and then they won in the cup last season. But yeah, I think that is it in 13 years. I think those are the only times that Marseille have beaten PSG home or away. PSG can get up for this fixture. They have that extra quality. Mbappe will be up for it. The only, the only perhaps question is that it comes straight after the international break. What kind of condition will some of the players be in? I mean, France actually play in Marseille a few days before mm. that against Chile. And it'll be interesting to see what, what reception Mbappe gets at the Velodrome for France on that night. Um, because I'm not 100% sure that Mbappe has played for France in Marseille before. It's, it's, it's obviously a rarity for them to play there. Um, perhaps he won't play all of France's matches, you know, all of the, 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 the two games over the international break. But will there be any temptation to rest him? Because they've got that cup semi-final coming up the following midweek. The Champions League the week after. I suspect not. I think Mbappe will play in that match. And I think if Mbappe plays and he's in the mood, I think that spells trouble for anybody. Yeah, the reception is going to be interesting. I'm, I think I'm right in saying it might be a slightly different kind of crowd for an international match than OM PSG. I, I think, you know, when he's turning out in blue, he'll get a good reception. Maybe not quite the same. It could be his last match at, uh, at the Velodrome for a while, couldn't it? Um, but that's certainly not, not to be missed. Uh, Marseille PSG on the Sunday, of course. Before then, I'm, I'm a great lover of, uh, of relegation battles. I just like to see the <laughs> desperation on fans and, and, and players and coaches. It's a masochist in me. We got, look, we got Lava against um, Montpellier, uh, which is going to be really interesting. 
Uh, I should make we should mention Lorient against Brest. That's another uh, derby of sorts, more friendly derby, fair to say, up in Brittany. Lorient scrapping against relegation Brest uh, at the other end of the table. The week after, fifth to seventh of April, looking through the fixtures. And by a quirk of the fixtures, Lille actually playing again on Friday at home to Marseille. So that's another big Friday night uh, at Lille. If they can beat Lens and Marseille, that will give them a real boost. PSG, well, that should be a certain win against Clermont at home. One would think so. And again, plenty of uh, relegation battles to lose against Strasbourg. Uh, Montpellier against Lorient. There'll be some you know, nervy players out there. Um, and getting back to your part of the world, Luke, uh, Monaco who uh, are at Metz this weekend, or I should say after the break, and the week after that, home against Rennes. Uh, how do you see Monaco now? They, they, they're just quite hard to, to work out, aren't they, Monaco, this season? Uh, those two matches coming up, a visit to Metz and then home to Rennes, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a bit of a, a phrase in, in France, you know, you know, four contre les forts et faibles contre les faibles. You know, you're good against the big teams and you're, you're poor against the poor teams. And, and that is kind of the way of Monaco. They're, they're quite poor at home in particular. I mean, not one at, at the Stade louis Deux since the turn of the year. It's clearly an issue. You know, you, people speak about the atmosphere in the stadium. Uh, does that play a part? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Um, but they're always up for the big occasion, which makes me worry more about the match against Metz than, than the one against Rennes, um, because you think that the, the big players will turn up for that occasion in, against Rennes, but maybe less so against Metz. Um, you know, that run beating uh, Lance at the ball out, uh, 0-0 against PSG, and then scraping over the line against Strasbourg, you thought that the, the corner had been turned, as it were, but... You know, that, that 94th minute Bakayoko top corner header uh, against his former club was, you know, a bit of a nail in the coffin. It, 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 was, it felt like a defeat. Um, I was there yesterday at the Stadley Rideau and it, it did definitely feel like a, a defeat at Stadley Rideau. So they need to not drop points against Mets. You know, Mets are, are one of those teams that should be down there right until the very end and, and will be scrapped until the end. So, you know, huge motivation for them to get some kind of result. But... Monaco have much superior quality and should be swatting them aside with relative ease. And then the Ren match is also followed by Lille, uh, both of which are at home. And I think that their season is played in this three-week period. And if they can come over the line with, you know, seven points, I think that they get Champions League spot. But yeah, it, it's, it's a difficult one for, for Monaco because, uh, as I say, they're, they're always up for the big occasion, but they drop way too many points at home and against the smaller sides that you'd expect them to beat. That relegation scrap, it's so close. Um, it, Claremont giving themselves a, a fighting chance with a win over the weekend. Gents, I'm going to ask you to put your, your reputations on the line. I'm going to just read the, uh, the fixtures for round 28. I want you to tell me the two teams going down and who's going to be in the, the dreaded playoff. So 5th, 7th of April, we got Lille, Marseille, Lens, Le Havre, PSG, Claremont, and on the Sunday, Brest, Metz, Montpellier, Lorient, Reims, Nice, Toulouse, Strasbourg, Monaco, Rennes, and Nantes, whoever's coaching Nantes, against Lyon. Andy, who are the bottom two, and who's uh, going to be 16th? Uh, I think that the bottom two will be the teams who are currently in the bottom two, Clermont and Metz, and I think that the playoff place, oh, it's really hard to predict. I mean, I, I, I uh, yeah, Nantes, or Le Havre, one of them. Luke, what do you reckon? Yeah, I agree with the Mets and Clermont. I think even with Mikotadza returning to something uh, like, you know, resembling the form that he showed in the during at the start of the season before he made that move to Wyatt, I, I think that there's not enough quality throughout the team for them to stay up. So I think they'll go down. I think Clermont are almost there already. Uh, I think Nantes is a weird one. I think there could be a new manager bounce. I, I think that Lorient and maybe Montpellier are in a bit of trouble. And one of those two, I think, for the for the playoff spot, I think that Nantes could just have that, that new manager bounce, get, you know, six, seven points in the next three, four games and just about get themselves out of trouble because that's that's all it takes. You know, it, it takes three wins, I think, and, and you're kind of looking relatively safe. So, yeah, I, I, I think Laurie and Montpellier, even Le Havre after that defeat against Clermont, uh, I think those two, but maybe Le Havre as well, all in trouble. I'm sure producer Stephen will go through the archives. I remember at the beginning of the season, a lot of people tipped not to go down and I thought they would be okay. And I'm starting to worry about that prediction of mine. What we can be sure of is going to go down to the wire for the bottom two and the 16th place, which means a playoff position. Well, thanks for joining us. Le Beaujo will be back in three weeks time, 8th of April, with your fix of all things Liga, Uber Eats and their implications for the continent and the world. 
We'll be looking into European matters, bringing you all the updates. PSG, OM and Lille set to do battle in their respective continental quarterfinals. Barcelona, Benfica and Aston Villa will have a Coupe de France final to preview and speculate wildly about. On top of that, French football expert Jonathan Johnson will turn his attentions to the impending clash between Ligue 1's two most successful clubs of the 20th century, PSG and Lyon, who have been on fairly different trajectories of late. And in Deja Vu, Land will, of course, be announcing the winner of that Teddy Tuma Stade de Reims jersey before dropping a new clue to start the race for a jersey from a man who is both Eglon and Super Eagle. That's right. We'll be giving away a signed jersey from Nice and Nigeria star Terum Moffi. We'll have all that and, of course, everything else from the world of French football. So that's all from Luke Entwistle, Andy Scott, myself, Andreas Evagora. Until next time, on behalf of the whole of Beaujeu team, bon match, au revoir, and à bientôt.